Captive dependency is bad. Luckily, there is one pattern to rescue. Hello and welcome to Code with Star. I'm Star, and today we're going to talk about the pattern that comes to rescue when we have captive dependency issue. This is the fifth video on the topic of dependency injection. We talked about the concept, the basic usage, the lifetime in the dependency injection, and there's some untied patterns. And today we're going to actually talk about a useful pattern. Let's dive in. Let's quickly go over the captive dependency and type pattern again. I'll use the doc report example that we are already familiar with. The doc report relies on two external services, iCLizer and iOutputter. The dependencies of uh, iCLizer and iOutputter are registered as a scoped service here, while the doc report is registered as a singleton. In this case, the doc report will capture the lifetime for its dependencies of iOutputter and iCLizer, and that's the anti pattern. If you want more details of the anti patterns, check out the episode 4. There, I talked all about the anti patterns. To see the issue, I also create this doc report controller. It takes in a doc report instance and it prints a doc in JSON when HTTP get is milked. If we run the code now, we're going to see an exception. As you can see, the exception is right about the captive dependency. A kind of fix of this issue is to make the dependencies singleton as well, just like I'm um, coding here. Now let me set up some breakpoints so, so that we can see when it runs. And we have 5 to start the debugging session. Once I curl into it, an instance of doc report is injected into the controller. You can take a glance to the dependencies of iOutputter and the Zeolizer. Curl by default will invoke the HTTP GET method. And here we see the output. Let's do the curl again. If you pay attention to the output, other than the doc information, there is a GUID. It's the same value for the two requests. That actually is outputted by the console outputter. It is designed that every instance will have a unique ID. Since the console output is registered as a singleton service, it will only create once across the whole lifetime of the application we will always see the same ID, no matter how many times we run it. Now the code runs, but this is an far from a good fix. To fix it this way, we will have to make every service a single term. And that is problematic. Firstly, not everything is a single term. Secondly, some services, like those I disposables, may hold critical resources like database connection or file streams that need to be disposed as soon as possible. Third, once there is a small leak in a singleton service, over time, it adds up. That leads to an application that have a memory leak issue. So it looks reasonable for us to seek for other ways to fix this issue. Taking an example of this I outputter, it is I disposable. Next, I'll show you how to use the simple factory pattern to fix the issue. We will need a simple factory. And let me create one here. There's only one method that's called create. It creates a new instance of a console outputter and it's going to return it. Now the reason this works is because the factory by itself doesn't hold any critical resource. So the factory can be registered as a single term and the return the instance of a console outputter as an I disposable could be disposed anytime. Let me show you what I mean. Instead of uh, register I outputter directly here, I'm going to register I outputter factory. Actually, I outputter factory is a bad name. It's not an interface. Let me rename it to outputter factory. 
Now that I opter itself is gone from the service graph, we'll need to update the services that rely on it to depend on the factory instead. Here I'm updating the doc report class. To make use of the factory that returns the night is possible, I'm going to use the using statement here. And the return the I opter will be disposed by the end of this me method. Okay, let's run it. Dog report is injected here. Let's step into print method. We're using the factory to create an I opter and then invokes right line on it. As you can see, it outputs the ID and then value. And if we keep running, by the end of this method, this pose is called on I outputter. Let's do it again. For those two different requests, as you can see now, the outputters have different IDs. And that's the usefulness of the factory pattern. Although the simple factory pattern is uh, effective and useful, it comes with uh, a flaw in it. Let's take a look at the code here in the outputter factory. It actually calls the constructor of console outputter. Now, it isn't a big deal. Um, since console outputter is very simple, it doesn't have any dependencies. But if you imagine the situation where console outputter depends on some other service, which depends on some other service, which depends on some other service, you're going to end up writing a lot of constructors here. And that defeats the purpose of using dependency injections. Next, I'll show you a technique to overcome this disadvantage. The first step is to put this uh, concrete console outputter class into the dependency container. To make sure it's short-lived, we're going to register it as a scoped service. Of course, if there's more dependencies um, by console outputter, we will need to register them as well. Coming back to the factory class, I'm going to inject another very useful service called iServiceScopeFactory. This iScopeFactory have a method called createScope, which returns an iDisposable scope. And on the scope, there is a scoped service provider, which will be short-lived by itself. And we're going to use that service provider to create the console outputter for this. Let's run it and see how it looks like. Curl it for the first time and note down the ID of uh, 650 and curl it again. This time 60D, that's a different ID. That means we are getting a different instance of the I outputter. Great, now we have a factory that we can work with. There is one more improvement that I want to show you. Imagine that we have another class that falls into the same pattern. Are we going to create another simple factory for that? It would work. It's less desirable. Now let's take a deep look at the current output of factory and see if we can generalize it or abstract it. It cares about two things. The service type and the implementation type. That means Maybe we could create a factory with generics. Let's see how to do it. First, we need two type parameters, one for the service type, one for the implementation type. Let me call them T service and T implementation. And then there is the constraint, the implementation type must implement the service type. Now, instead of returning the I operator, the create method will return the service type. Here, I'm not 100% sure that we will need the service to implement the I disposable. Let's put it there. We can get back to it when we have a consumer example. And of course, it will get in the implementation type of the service provider. Now, let's register the factory. Since it is a generics, there is a special syntax for it. We're saying outputter factory is generic with two parameters.
Now let's update the doc report to see how to consume it. The service type would be iOutputter and the implementation type would be console outputter. Take a look at it here. When the time the factory returns the service type, the type is determined. And we would know if that is an I disposable or not. So we don't have to constrain it in the factory. Now let's see it in action. Run it once, twice. Dispose method has been called twice and they have different IDs. It seems like we successfully generalized the factory. And this pattern should be able to apply anywhere, which otherwise would be a captive dependency. All right, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you have any comments. Press the like button if you like it and subscribe if you want more. I'll see you the next time. Until then, take care.